Welcome back, everybody. So the newest piece of work from our next guest is an invitation to learn to love our own bodies, to unsubscribe from everything that we think we know about our bodies and begin healing from the trauma that our bodies are carrying around. She is a clinical psychologist, award-winning researcher and author of her new book, The Wisdom of Your Body, Finding Healing, Wholeness and Connection Through Embodied Living. We're so excited to have you on the show. Welcome, Hilary L. McBride. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with you. So let's start with um, learning a little bit a bit more about embodied living, what it is and why it's so important that you wanted to write a book about that right now. So I had been sick for a very, very long time and I was seeing a therapist, Liz, and she was kind of my last ditch effort for recovery in a long line of different interventions that I had received about working on my eating disorder. I had an eating disorder, which at that point was life-threatening and really eroding who I was all of the beautiful parts of my life. And at that point, I had been labeled with all of these different diagnostic labels that had quickly replaced my name. They had taken over my sense of identity, things like anorexia nervosa, OCD, depression, trauma, and anxiety. So we started looking at eating disorder prevention and particularly what it's like for us as women to love our bodies, hoping that maybe if we understood that, then we would be able to prevent eating disorders. But what I found is that a big chunk of eating disorder prevention focuses on body image. It's this idea that we hold in our minds of what our body looks like. And generally we have feelings about that image. We think that that image is a good thing or not so good thing. And we evaluate our bodies based on what we've been told is good or not good. But at the same time as it's helpful to think about our image positively, it is not the same thing as living in our bodies. Because if we have a healthy body image, we're still seeing our bodies primarily as a thing, as an image that we like or don't like. These two words, words matter, have come up a lot over the last few years related to other social issues, but it can apply here in terms of the disconnect between um, our body and our mind based on language. For example, that phrase mind over matter. So how do these types of phrases, these commonly used phrases, influence women in particular and shape narratives around women and the female form? Yeah, over time phrases like I think therefore I am, which is mm -hmm. uh, something that we were handed down by Plato and Descartes, right? The separation between mind and body and the mind over matter discourse has become the foundation of the way that we relate to our bodies. And there's this interesting thing that happens particularly around how women's bodies are constructed socially, which is that we're seen in a patriarchal culture as being less valuable than men in particular, but the way that we accrue social power is by having a body that is desirable. So although we are not our bodies, somehow bodies are the way that we become desirable and valuable and feel better about ourselves. And so we start to say things like, my body won't let me, or I can't believe my body won't do this, without realizing that our language kind of tells on us. That's very heavy, I think, especially as mm -hmm. women to take in because we've been told for so long, I think, especially in North America as women, um, that we should hate our bodies. So what kind of impact mm -hmm. does that have on us? And then how do we unlearn these lies that we right. have been told for so, so long? The research about body dissatisfaction shows us, and body hatred really, and is that up to about 90% of us in Western cultures and those communities touched by globalization, inclusive of women and men, that we loathe our bodies, that this story about bodies is hurting us. It's impacting our mental health. It's impacting our physical health. It's impacting the way that we respond to our peers, the ways that we socialize and the way that we construe what it means to be valuable as people. So numbers this high and this pervasive among women and men have led us in the research community to decide that this is something called normative discontent, that it is so frequently occurring that it's normal. doesn't mean it's healthy. doesn't mean it's the way that it should be. But there is this kind of thing that's in the discourse that most people, if they have not felt inside of themselves, they understand and can recognize in the social fabric around them. Because we've been taught to see our bodies as objects. We've been taught to see our bodies as appearances that we evaluate as good or not so good. 
it's this kind of um, the way that I think about it is like a hand me down shame that just ends up consuming our time mm. and our energy and our money and our opportunities. So you talk about how oppression is a form of collective trauma that can often go unrecognized, especially when it comes to our bodies. So can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Oppression often goes unrecognized as a form of trauma because rarely is it one single event that a person can point to. It's a collection of things that have happened over time. So one study that I share about in the book concluded that people in oppressed or marginalized groups can actually meet all of the criteria necessary for a diagnosis of PTSD, but they don't have that single life-threatening event usually associated with PTSD. So whenever we're talking about power and oppression, it's really important to talk about how the systems that give some people power and keep it from others are both constructed and concrete. They're, they're material. They actually impact our physical bodies. To say that they're constructed really means that there are these categories of value that are created by our minds. They're, they're made up. To say that they are concrete or material or physical means that the impacts of these made up categories actually impact us in a very real and tangible way. So an example of this, just to make it really concrete, is gender, right? The gender binary of like, this is what a man does and this is what a woman does are made up. And there are stories that are so reinforced and concrete that it's hard to imagine that they're actually a story. Right? I just had a little baby girl and it was amazing how people, no matter what we told them, just gave us pink things, right? Here's the story. You have a girl, mm -hmm. here are the things that you give a girl. So the story goes around the gender binary. If you're born with a penis, you need to act a certain way. Act this way, tuck your emotions away, be strong, be stoic. If you're born with a vulva, act a different way and do not, as the story goes, don't stray from this. Otherwise you'll be hurt or ostracized and you'll be excluded from the social resources that you need to survive. And if we hear these stories enough over time and we have little or no access to different stories, everything just kind of keeps flowing along as planned socially. So the epilogue to this book is entitled A Letter to My Body and you start the letter with the words, I'm sorry, I love you. So what is one thing that you want us to remember about our own bodies and reflect on when we think about how we view ourselves? Oh, it's going to be so hard to stay with just one. I guess that's why I wrote a book about it, because <laughs> I have more than just one thing to say. But I'll leave you with this. Our bodies, no matter what we have been told, no matter what we have been shown by the societies that we exist in, our bodies are good. They're good. That's it. Full stop. And all bodies are good. Our bodies are our home. They are the place where we exist. They are the, the, the seat of our existence. And no matter what we have been shown, no matter how those stories have impacted us, we can heal and we can heal and we can come home to ourselves and experience our bodies as good the way that they were always meant to be. Hillary, thank you so much for this beautiful and important and challenging conversation. It's been so open to to talk to you. So the book is called The Wisdom of Your Body, Finding Healing, Wholeness, and Connection Through Embodied Living. It's in stores November 9th. Check it out and we'll be right back.